<clears throat> okay, um, after the capture of the two strong points near the center of the British line, leaving their position untenable, as they would call it, um, the British called it off, at least that particular army. On October <coughs> 17th, 1781, that would be four years to the day after Burgoyne's surrender at Saratoga, uh, a, a British officer appeared on top of the, their earthen parapet holding up a white handkerchief on his sword, accompanied by a drummer who's out there to make some noise so they'll notice him up there. They're asking for terms. The next day, October 16th, 1781, a uh, peace conference was held in a farmhouse outside the lines. So they, they agreed on terms, and on October 19th, 1781, six years and six months exactly since Lexington and Concord, the British troops marched out of their fortifications down a straight road about two miles long to an area designated ever since as Surrender Field. And there the ceremonies of surrender took place. General Cornwallis just couldn't face this, so he pretended to be sick and sent a a designee to carry this out. Uh, the officer offered his sword to the French commander, he a senator of the colonists. The Frenchman refused it, and so he offered it to Washington, who would only accept it from his equal, Cornwallis, and designated General Benjamin Lincoln, no kin to Abraham, as far as we know, who had been the one who surrendered the American forces at Yorktown, at um, Charlestown. So. Supposedly, reportedly, a British military band played a popular song of the day called The World Turned Upside Down. That was so it must have seemed to them. So, is that the end of the war? Well, no. Not technically. If you go there now, there's this little overlook. You look down at the rail fence and all that. And you punch a button and hear a voice that sounds like George, like uh, James Earl Jones, <laughs> describing it all, concluding with, The war was over. We had won. Well, it turned out that way. But uh, anyway, when the news arrived in London, the Prime Minister, Lord North, reportedly threw up his hands and said, Oh God, it's all over. It took a while to untangle all the knots, but there, there were still 30 some odd thousand troops, British troops in North America, or over 50,000 in, well, 30 some odd in, in, in the colonies, the former colonies, the United States by then over 50,000 in North America, and they could have continued the war, especially since they had uh, had uh, set off on a major, major military buildup, doubling their national debt uh, again. Talk about something backfiring. But uh, anyway, peace negotiations had been underway for a while uh, in France between American and British um, representatives. And so they, they reached an agreement where Britain would recognize the independence of the colonies, allow the colony, the former, its former colonies, allow them to continue their fishing rights off southeastern Canada, the Grand Banks area, that sort of thing, and over more than double the land area. Now, they could have insisted that we would that our western boundary would be the old proclamation line of 1763. Instead, and the prime minister took care of this, the, the British have a history that's like more than 2,000 years. That's different from our much more shallow history. For us, if it's going to happen next year, we don't need to worry about it yet. In Britain, if it's going to happen century after next, they better start getting ready. <laughs> so. Uh, the British Prime Minister seems to have realized that he couldn't stop the United States from becoming independent. And that if we could hold it together long enough, we would eventually grow into an immensely powerful country somewhere down the road. The only thing he could influence in 1781 or two there was whether when we grew to maturity we would be Britain's friend or Britain's enemy. He thought friend would be better. So the terms of the treaty, British, the British allowed us all the land south of the Great Lakes, east of the Mississippi, and north of Florida, which Spain had regained control of, or at least a claim on, the northern boundary being undefined at that time. This was an immense increase. Meanwhile, we've made some promises to them. We'll come back to that in another thing. So. Uh, 
we were bound by treaty to France. One of the terms was we could not call the war off and leave them holding the bag. So our treaty did not formally take effect until September 1783 with the signing of the Peace of the Treaty of Paris of 1783. The war was over. Okay, so control of the sea failed the British uh, at a critical time. One little thing, Yorktown, where Cornwallis surrendered, that was the shoestring tackle that ended the British war in America. Yorktown is only about 20 miles from where old Jamestown had once stood. The site had been abandoned by then for three quarters of a century and it was part of somebody's plantation, but it's kind of uh, ironic in a way. Um, 20 miles and 170 some odd years from uh, the beginning to the end of British America. Okay, now we're going to look at uh, American special problems. Our list is shorter, the problems are worse. And the first one is a little bit slippery in a way, you might say, and that is that the very principles we were fighting for constituted a problem special problems. So we're engaged in a desperate war against a very, very powerful adversary. Conventional wisdom holds that governments need more power during wartime than they do during peacetime. And we don't even have an official government. All we had was the Second Continental Congress, which was an unofficial uh, gathering of representatives of the various colonies who presently declared themselves to be free and independent states independent not only from Britain, but from each other as well. And it has no legal standing. It can't pass laws, it can't levy taxes, can't do any of that stuff. But it did do things only governments can do because it had to be done. They, uh, the uh, Second Continental Congress carried out diplomacy with foreign governments and made treaties with them. It created armies and appointed generals to command them. It uh, uh, borrowed money on the bad credit <laughs> the United States, uh, but the, the thing is, uh, what people are fighting for, freedom and independence, those are code words for not ever having to obey any law or pay any attack, any tax that originated higher up than your own state government. So that prevents effectively, I mean, people, this is part of what they're fighting against. We're not going to create some centralized American parliament to do to us what we're fighting to keep the British parliament from doing to us. Got it? So when we need a centralized government the most, our very principles prevent us from setting one up. George Washington. Now, the, the supplement makes it sound like he never did get this, but he did about four years in. He wanted Congress to authorize an army of American regulars who would accept full military discipline and agree to stay with it till hostilities are completed, the rest, the duration of the war. Congress wouldn't do it because it represents states that are jealous of each other. And those men were more afraid of a centralized American government than they were of losing the war because I guess it makes sense. So they held out for the longest time. And history has shown that they, they lucked out there. Um, there have been a lot of revolutions since then, and I can only think of one. I keep thinking I'm looking in the mirror. Revolution, a successful revolution, where the revolutionary, the triumphant revolutionary war general did not go on to become a dictator. And that was ours. And we owe that completely to an amazingly unusual man named George Washington, who was as much of an anti-monarchist as the next man. And um, although he was intensely ambitious to be respected and looked up to, he somehow the allurements of power did not entice him. He was oblivious to that. So he had at least two chances when he could have uh, if he'd wanted personal power that would last the rest of his life, it was within his grasp. He turned away from it both times. We'll get back to that later. Uh, plus, just there was this weird idea held by congressmen who never heard a shot fired in anger that just revolutionary virtue would overcome 
would compensate. And we have amateurs out there serving one year at a time. By the time you get them half trained, they're going home again. That, but their parts are pure. That will enable them to overcome uh, British professional soldiers. Okay, next problem, monetary chaos. We're using pieces of paper as money. Uh, all the states plus the Continental Congress printed up IOUs and spent them. It's a form of borrowing. Uh, the ones printed by Congress were called Continentals. And each one was worth a certain amount of silver that the government would pay someday, doesn't say when, doesn't pay interest, anything like that. And the pressure, under the pressure of war, they kept printing more of them and more of them and more of them and inflation set in. And you have a two-tiered price system, which is inconceivable with our money now. But then, with paper money that was uh, denominated in currency, silver money, you could have merchants who accept the paper only at a discount. That there's this price if you have silver, this price if all you got is paper. Plus, the British are counterfeiting this stuff night and day to make it worse. The uh, Continentals became the byword for worthlessness. A byword for worthlessness. Uh, the expression not worth a continental was in use for, I don't know, upwards of 150 years after the revolution in the original 13 states. They deteriorated to valuelessness. There's an anecdote involving a barber, maybe in Philadelphia, not sure, decided he needed new wallpaper in his barber shop and ended up papering the walls with continentals because it cost less to paper the walls with money than it would take money to buy wallpaper. The money was not worth its surface area in wallpaper. Finally, deeply divided public opinion. Now, the British were not exactly sure they want to do this, but they're not shooting at each other. We were. This was deeply divisive. The American Revolutionary War was a civil war in every sense of the term. People who favored independence would be referred to either as patriots or as uh, a word that's slipped out of use, but it used to carry a lot of freight, Whigs, W-H-I-G. That was the more conservative English political party, actually not conservative, got it backward. In England, the Whig party uh, favored the king being relegated to a ceremonial role only and the, the House of Commons exercising power. That's really what was going on. So... You have those. Uh, those who were opposed to independence were called uh, loyalists. They didn't mind that. Or Tories, which was a false charge. That's the other English political party. The Tories um, supposedly favored the king exercising actual power. The thing is, there wasn't really any big difference in political theory or belief between the patriots and the Tories in America. They believe pretty much the same thing. So what's the difference? As often happens in politics, these people were divided by their fears. Okay, if your main fear is that the British government is going to clamp down on us and essentially rule over us so we, uh, we have to obey laws that came across the, from across the sea, that sort of, that's your main fear. That's going to put you in the Patriot camp. If you think those fears are overblown, that the British government is 3,000 miles away, what are they going to do to us? That what Your real fear is not that the British are going to do that, or even if they did, the benefits of being the empire outweigh those uh, grievances. Uh, your real fear is the social structure coming unglued. It was still a hierarchical social structure with comfortable people up here and on down. And if this revolutionary thing gets out of hand, this could turn into not just a, a political war, but a social war. This could turn into class warfare, and that would be ugly. If that's your main fear, you probably oppose independence. So I'm going to have to stop again.